Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. Thank you for tuning in and joining us to uh, talk about emotional design uh, and products. We're just going to wait a couple of minutes um, to allow anyone else who wants to join us to log in. We've uh, got about 25 here, I think, at the moment, and there are a few more signed up. So we're just going to wait until um, a couple of minutes past two before I make a start. Um, just to remind you all, this is part of the staff's innovation webinar series. So there's a whole load of these that you can sign up to uh, if you go to staffs.ac.uk forward slash events. Um, you can see on there, and there's more coming up. I think next week there's one about funding, and then there's another one following me. They keep uh, they keep going, so keep an eye out for those. Um, and also, I think if you look on Twitter and social media, we've got a hashtag staffs innovation uh, hashtag for for looking at the kind of what previous um, presentations have been on and what future ones that come up as well. So feel free to have a look at that if you want to. I can see a few more people just logging in, so we'll just wait. Uh, one more minute before I make a start. Okay, so I think um, just give it another 30 seconds and then make a start on the um, presentation. Um, thanks again for joining me. I hope you're all well in uh, lockdown or semi-lockdown, maybe now. Um, as I mentioned, we've got this uh, whole series of webinars. Uh, just go on to our Staff Uni website and on the events section or staffs.ac.uk forward slash events to see uh, more uh, in this series coming up. But um, I think we'll make a start now. So uh, this is my webinar for an introduction to emotional design and how to make people fall in love with your products. Um, I'm Dan Lewis, I'm the course leader for industrial design, products and transport at Staffordshire University. So uh, I teach a course that has uh, two distinct pathways and our students can either specialise in product design or transport design depending on their area of interest. Um, so if I click through, so first of all, a little bit about me. As I mentioned, I'm the course leader for industrial design. Um, I've got over 10 years experience in the design industry, bringing lots of products to the market. Um, currently working on my PhD, focusing on emotional design, which has led me to today's webinar. Uh, and I mentioned the Staffs Innovation hashtag on Twitter, and I'm also on Twitter at, at Dan Lewis Design if you wanted to have a look at that and some of the kind of things I post. Um, some pictures there of myself and me with my students. Um, if you want to change the size of the presentation, you can do that on um, the uh, go to webinar control panel section so where you see the powerpoint and the little webcam of me you can resize that if you want to see the uh, see the powerpoint a bit bigger and probably less of me uh, but there you can see some of the products i've developed um, for companies like john lewis um, and where i previously worked uh, a company called alpherson we generated lots of furniture um, for pretty much all the uk retailers really so i've got a lot of experience um, in design so if I move on to what is emotional design, uh, emotional design aims to understand how human emotions are affected by objects and experiences. And I'm looking at this from a designer's point of view. I'm not a psychologist or uh, anything like that. Um, I'm looking at it certainly from an industrial design point of view. Uh, and by understanding how consumers respond to different products, uh, designers can strengthen those relationships between people and products by evoking desirable emotions. And the term emotional design was first used in 1999, so over 20 years ago now. Um, and the Design and Emotion Society was established at the Delft University of Technology in the same year. And they're some of the leading researchers in the area of emotional design. So if we just start, for example, this is Robin Day's 1963 stackable polyside chair. And no doubt you'll have a certain feeling about this chair and it really differ for each of you. Um, and you may have associated memories because of its common use in schools and hospitals and doctor's surgeries. Uh, you can probably remember how the chair behaves in terms of its functionality, how comfortable it is to sit in. And you know that if you want to lean back and balance, you probably can get it to do that. And you'll no doubt have an opinion about the way it looks, its aesthetics. Uh, its simplicity and its colour, and you might hate it because it was so common, or you might think it's a design classic. 
Um, but all of those things kind of evoke different emotions in terms of its meaning and the way it looks and everything else. So emotional design covers that whole experience you have with products. And there are a lot of emotions. In 1980, psychologist Robert Chip created his Wheel of Emotions. It looks a bit like this. And this Wheel of Emotions has eight primary bipolar emotions on it. So that's kind of the inner band, uh, the, the kind of second to inner band rather. Um, and those kind of eight primary bipolar emotions are joy and sadness, anger and fear, trust and disgust, and surprise and anticipation. And they can range in strength, a bit like a colour wheel, um, from being quite mild or a pale colour of maybe annoyance, and then moving along to anger, and then rage being the strongest of those that particular emotion. Um, and also these emotions can mix like colours as well. So if you look on the right hand side of the colour wheel or of the emotion wheel, um, you can see maybe that terror and amazement of being near a huge powerful waterfall could produce a feeling of awe. So we can have mixed emotions as well in product experiences. And products, I think, can either kind of whisper or shout and somewhere in between as well, creating either a focal point in the room or quietly supporting an overall aesthetic. It's often linked to cost because simple standard components can help produce very affordable products. But sometimes designers, particularly prominent designers, people like Luke Stark, will create products that aim to attract our attention, possibly shocking us, evoking our emotions. So if we look at some more product examples, there's going to be lots of images on my presentation, which I, I like certainly. Uh, first of all, if you have a look at this, I would say that this is a product that really kind of whispers really. It's going to support an overall aesthetic in a room. Maybe you decided you're on trend and you're going to make everything grey. Um, but this isn't Argos Light. It's six pounds. It's it's fairly basic compared to something like Philip Stark's 18 karat gold gun lamp for floss. This is really about making a statement and evoking a stronger emotional response. Um, the gold, the contrast between the gold plated body and the black shade is really a, a statement about the fragility of life and it's meant to symbolise the links between money and death. Uh, and Philippe Stark wants this to shock, the price also would probably shock you, it's £1,600 so you could buy over 260 Argos lamps for one floss lamp. Um, the, uh, some of the profits are donated to an anti-poverty charity but clearly here Philippe Stark is trying to appeal and to emotions and evoke a strong emotional response, which there is a place for, not for all products, but for some. And sometimes bad is good. You'd assume negative emotions should be avoided at all costs, but sometimes we willingly experience negative emotions. And it isn't the same for everyone, but I imagine some people in this webinar will no doubt love the emotions of apprehension and fear that roller coasters create while others will hate it. So you might be familiar with the terror at Disney World. So this is a ride that creates an experience uh, to kind of simulate a lift going wrong, falling to earth. And that apprehension and fear that you're gonna get in that is enjoyable to many people, not everyone. And research suggests that negative emotions can also help build a relationship between consumers and their products creating a richer experience. As with life, not everything is happy and it's a rich experience for everything that you go through as well. And it's not just roller coasters, maybe you like horror movies, the Saw films, I can't watch those, but some people do, or sad films as well. Also, um, you know, kind of gaming, people can get really angry and annoyed through gaming because of the challenge that's there, but that's still an enjoyable process um, and an enjoyable experience for people. So designers can exploit that. This is an app called Zombies Run. If you haven't seen this before, it's a kind of app that you use when running or jogging. And it puts you through headphones in a kind of soundscape and it creates a story. So if you are running a bit slowly, then you'll hear zombies catching you and trying to, uh, trying to get to you. So it uses negative emotions of kind of fear and gamifies your run. So you can create products that embed negative emotions uh, that actually add to a richer experience. And all of this has been researched quite a lot over the last 20 years 
there's a lot of existing theories out there from other design researchers, um, psychologists, industrial designers. Um, and these are the kind of categories or ways in which each of these researchers has split up the experience we have with products. And Donald Norman is probably one of the most famous um, emotional design researchers. He's written a few books on the subject and he breaks down in simplest terms our experience with products into three levels. The visceral level, which is about our aesthetic experience. So what does something look like? What's our very immediate reaction and response to it? The behavioral level is uh, focusing on what it feels like to use a product, how it works. And then the reflective level is kind of the meaning of that product, maybe the memories we have associated with it, maybe how it facilitates actions, activities with other people. Um, so that's his, his is really simple. And then if we look at Jordan, for example, Pat Jordan, um, his ideal pleasure focuses on the aesthetics, which is a lot like Donald Norman's visceral level. His social pleasure involves emotions derived from experience using products with others and also concerns things like personal status and self-image. For instance, the car you, you drive, that will probably be telling other people something about you and the way you dress and what you wear. Physio pleasure relates to sensory organs, so kind of touch, taste and smell. And psycho pleasure of Jordan's uh, theory relates to cognitive and emotional reactions. And then some researchers like Chitori on the top right there, uh, he's split it down very simply into utilitarian benefits, which are the functional benefits of the product and hedonic benefits, which he sees as the kind of luxuries, but also relate to things like the way a product looks uh, and feels. So there's a lot kind of already out there and everyone's got different theories about how to split up the different parts of the product uh, experience. Um, so if I move on to what I'm doing at the moment, I'm splitting it down into my own kind of three key themes. And they're based on the aesthetics of a product or a service, uh, its functionality and how it works and what it means to people. So it's meaning is really important. So those three points I've just mentioned, aesthetics, functionality, meaning, I've now put those on the bottom left of the slide there. And I'm going to talk through strategies for emotional design that fit within each of those three themes for the rest of the presentation now, about 10 minutes in. So if I look at aesthetics first, the way it looks obviously is really important. And designers have always and will continue to consider how the aesthetics of a product will communicate its function and its purpose. And then they're going to add detail design to highlight product features or convey a feeling of quality. And materials, colours, graphics and finishes can then convey deeper, more meaningful messages, perhaps referring back to iconic products, the history of a brand or cultural references, and that might differ depending on where the product is to be retailed. If we look at, for instance, a Dyson handheld vacuum cleaner, um, you can see that the designers made a decision on the top of this product where you've got a kind of a plastic molding that go, covers the cyclone assembly to use that form to try and communicate a certain level of technical prowess. There's no need really for that um, plastic cover to be that shape, but it communicates to the consumer, okay, this is powerful. You can see how it's working. You can see how some of the components might be there and it, yeah, it kind of communicates power. So that's, that's how you can use form to communicate um, function. Another thing I mentioned kind of referring back to iconic products, you know, you've got design DNA that designers carry through products. And if we look at BMW as a classic example and their um, kind of double or split grill, that's something that's very iconic to that brand and that people recognize instantly. It's not something you want to throw away. You can certainly evolve it, which is what BMW have always done and will continue to do. Um, so uh, the way it looks is a really important part of creating that connection between people and products. If we move on to visual metaphors, this is another aesthetic technique to create an emotional connection between people and products. And they can be a really useful tool to communicate with consumers and explain a function, just like the previous slide. But also metaphors can inject a sense of fun or humor into a product in the same way metaphors can within written language. Um, and the visual design of an object should communicate meaning and function. 
um, often described as semantics. So maybe if you look at a drill, all of the bits on a cordless drill you interact with, like the trigger and uh, the battery section and stuff, they're all going to be one colour so that you recognise those are the bits that you interact with and those are the, the areas you use. So as a product example, this is an hourglass coffee maker. It's got a section in it that you put your kind of ground coffee beans, you add some water into uh, the bottom section and screw, um, screw it back together and then you turn it over just like an hourglass and that coffee will then be, uh, the water will filter through the coffee and create uh, your drink. And that kind of visual metaphor, that cultural awareness that we have for an hourglass and how you use that communicates to the consumer how they should use it. And also the Alessi uh, whistling bird kettle. I don't know if you've seen this before, I'm sure you have. Um, this is a um, design that takes that functional element of the whistle at the end of the kettle spout, puts a little bird on there, and it kind of just, again, it injects a sense of play, uh, a sense of fun, and perhaps makes that experience a little bit more memorable than if it didn't have that bird. You might think it's naff or tacky, or you might really like it, you might see it as another kind of design classic, but it will evoke an emotion, hopefully, either way. We move on to anthropomorphism. Okay, so anthropomorphic designs apply human attributes to products, both in terms of aesthetics, but also behaviour. In the same way you look at a kind of Disney character that's a, an animal and it's been anthropomorphised, um, so it's got human characteristics, it, it probably emotes, its face will emote in a way that real animals can't. I think that was some of the criticism of the recent kind of Lion King film. Um, they can't emote because animals don't emote in the same way as humans. So. Uh, Disney make animals more human, basically. And anthropomorphic designs connect with us on an emotional level because of how connected we all are to each other and the high personal significance of the human body and face to us. So if you look at these two illustrations here on the right, um, you probably think that um, top right kind of face maybe is a little bit more aggressive maybe a little bit kind of technical, uh, robotic maybe, quite sharp. And then the bottom face is much cuter and more friendly. And that would make sense because, you know, that's a Lamborghini Aventador and that's a Fiat 500. And the character of those cars and the kind of people they want to appeal to is different. So you can use the front of a car or, front of a, or part of a product and add human characteristics to create a, uh, an emotional response, uh, evoke an emotional response in a consumer. An anthropomorphism can be applied really overtly or more subtly with a product having a pinched waistline or features that echo those of a human face and it can create a sense of familiarity which is always good in design and helps connect products with people. So if we look at this Sensio coffee maker, it's a few years old now this product, uh, but it's a nice example of a very kind of subtle uh, anthropomorphic design in that it's designed to have the stance kind of of a butler slightly leaning forward presenting uh, a drink uh, and, and kind of that's the idea it's about mimicking a behavior rather than looking specifically like uh, a character and then as i mentioned kind of before with a sense of fun you get other alessi products um, like the um, magic bunny toothpick holder so you lift up the bunny out of the hat and toothpicks come out of it um, and then you've got the uh, energy corkscrew as well and again the emotional connection between that product that corkscrew and a standard corkscrew that isn't doesn't have any anthropomorphism doesn't feel like a character and something you connect with it means you'll probably have a stronger relationship with this and keep it longer possibly even keeping it if it broke which people do you know keep work products that don't work anymore simply because they have a connection to them and as I said, kind of some are more overt as well. So the Jean-Paul Gaultier kind of uh, perfume bottle, it's clearly uh, very obvious um, based on a female figure, um, but then other bottles, things like Coca-Cola bottle were also designed for the same reason to have this pinched waistline and be more seductive. Um, so anthropomorphism can be applied very, as I mentioned, obviously and overtly or kind of used subtly. And we've now moved on to the functionality section of my three key themes and how does it work? And clearly the functionality of the product is really important. 
and experiences that are uncomfortable, frustrating, or confusing are going to evoke negative emotions and not the place where you want to evoke negative emotions. And products that people love are often easy to use, they're comfortable, and as with um, kind of anthropomorphic designs, they often feel familiar, so you might recognize an element of them. And then emotions of trust, pride, and love will develop over time when products continue to work well for people. Things like maybe you have a kitchen knife that you always use, and the more you use it, it's, there's a kind of element of trust there. You know how it operates, and you can probably start chopping faster and trust that you're not going to injure yourself because you're used to it. You've got a kind of relationship with it. This is a great example of a product um, designed by Smart Design, a New York uh, design consultancy. And on the um, far left, you can see um, an original potato peeler that a designer's mum used, but she had arthritis and she really struggled to use it. Um, it was kind of tricky, it didn't, didn't, wasn't very comfortable. Um, and he basically had the idea of sticking a kind of bike handle to it. And over the years that's developed and, um, and kind of been refined, but these are a whole range now of OXO Good Grip products and they're really good. And by trying to solve a problem for someone with uh, arthritis or perhaps other disabilities, you can create products that actually are better for everyone. Um, so sometimes an inclusive design approach works really well. This is the on the right, the Braun calculator from the 1970s, um, something that then Apple uh, basically replicated on their calculator app in iOS. And this is really about that familiarity, knowing that people would be able to use it straight away, understand it, it's got the same layout, the same colours. Um, again, familiarity in terms of creating a connection and ease of use is really important. And of course, products like Angle Boys Lamp have been around for a really long time because they just work well. And people, again, they're familiar, you understand how to use it, perhaps you've got associated memories of it in kind of old, in maybe your kind of granddad's office or, or study or on his desk or something. So in terms of functionality, it just works and all of these products just work. So that's a, clearly a really important part of emotional design. And surprise is a great way to add a sense of fun to a product and create a memorable connection. And research shows that surprising or fascinating products can see the consumer experience in pride of ownership and and brand loyalty can also increase that way as well. Weirdly, it's not a one-time event and research actually shows that consumers can continue to be surprised by more than once by product features. Um, so if we have a look at this product, this is a ceramic product designed by uh, Emma Lacey and her intention here was to create surprising products from a kind of emotional design point of view. And this is one of the designs, this cup and saucer, the cup has a rounded base Based saucer has a, the same rounded kind of uh, bowl shape within it. And when you pour tea in it or coffee or whatever you're drinking, it just rocks slightly. Again, it's this kind of slightly playful, um, surprising thing that you might not expect to happen. Or certainly maybe family and friends who haven't used these before wouldn't expect it to happen. Where I worked before, uh, my previous role, um, we worked with Studio Conran um, and they are uh, you probably know Terence Conran, perhaps, and Sophie Conran, the Conran family, a design agency, and they designed this cabinet. And on the front here, you've got a couple of drawers, you've got a couple of covered doors, you've got a kind of flap that opens upwards and rolls back, but they're all touched to open. You don't know which side the door is going to open, where it's going to open, you don't quite know um, how it's going to interact. But they liked the idea of this surprise and delight, they called it. Um, of you kind of discovering that and then once you know where they are you're going to learn that over time and it becomes something that you know about but perhaps other people don't when they interact with it so you've got this little element of surprise um, through it by the way I should have mentioned if you've got any questions um, but the minute that um, and Anna who is facilitating this session is going to feed those back to me at the end I should mention that <clears throat> another quick uh, surprise example is uh, kind of antique puzzle boxes, or you may have seen kind of furniture with hidden compartments on the antique roadshow and things like that. And again, it's this sense of uh, fun and play and surprise that you might not know about. And then once you know about it, you have a greater 
um, kind of relationship with that product. So if you're developing a new product or service, you can think what could possible surprising or yeah, kind of fascinating features be that are going to enhance the relationship and make memorable experiences. Another strategy within the functionality theme is slow design. And slow design is part of the slow movement, which um, I think the first thing started actually with slow food as a reaction to fast food. And there's been a lot of stuff in terms of slow movement. Uh, recently, there was a TV program where there was a camera on a canal boat and you just watched it go along for eight hours or something. It did not speed up, it went at the slow pace. Uh, and this is really aiming to relax the pace of life, improve the well-being of individuals. We hear a lot about uh, mindfulness at the moment. And I think maybe over lockdown, some people have, may have reassessed how much time they spend rushing around and think, oh, actually, I could reduce this a bit. Um, but it also benefits things like the environment um, if you're retaining products for longer. So there's lots of qualities of slow design, but one of the most relevant to emotional design is the consideration of pace at which people use products. So two examples here. First of all, is this Breville one cup hot water dispenser. I've got one of these, they're great, because you just press the button, go back in 30 seconds and your perfectly dispensed hot water for your tea or coffee is ready. But then there's also times when you might want to use a teapot. It's a totally different experience. There's almost a more kind of um, ceremonial element to a teapot and putting that in the middle of the table with a group of family or friends uh, and brewing tea and pouring tea that day is very different in terms of that social experience than pressing the button on an instant cup thing. So you can build kind of emotions into design by looking at the pace at which products are used. And clearly this is good for some products and not for others. You only want it to be slow until the point that it becomes annoying. If you're about to work and you need to make a really quick drink, you want the top product. But considering the pace at which the user is going to use your product is a way to consider its uh, emotional design. So we're still on the functionality section and I'm now moving on to nudge. So you may have heard of nudge theory before, but nudge design is a kind of subtle uh, way of presenting the consumer with options that allow them to make a choice or response or behavior. Um, effective design, on the other hand, is much kind of louder, brasher. It's like a fire alarm. It shouts its message to us and forces an emotional response. So if we look at some examples, Apple's screen time feature is a real kind of a good example of nudge design, that it presents to you data of how long you spent on each app or each category of apps. So you can see this user here has been on Facebook for 32 minutes, Instagram for 26 minutes, Twitter 15 minutes. So they've spent over an hour on social media. And it's not saying you can't do this, you can't go on these anymore unless you set that. But what it's doing is it's presenting you the data to go, hmm, do I want to spend that long on it? Or actually, could I use my time better? So that's a little bit of nudge design. Also, when the uh, windscreen washer fluid in your car is low, you're going to get a little nudge, a little, little reminder to tell you about that. You're not getting a, a loud alarm, maybe in the same way as if you're not wearing a seatbelt. You know, that's not nudge, this is a nudge. Um, and this is a, a really great example. It's a bit of a weird one, but it's a, a sticker of a fly that is stuck to the inside of a urinal in the men's toilets. Um, and this was in the Scripple Airport in Amsterdam, and it was found that just by doing that, it reduced spillage by 80%. So it's an interesting little nudge. There's nothing there forcing you to do anything, but it is affecting behavior um, with a, a, just a very simple solution. So I'm now going to move on to the meaning theme of my three key themes. And this is looking at kind of people, places, and memories, and that's really important for emotional design. Products that mean the most to us and those we retain often for the longest amount of time tend to have attached memories and meanings. And this may include items received as gifts, objects, bought on memorable holidays, or perhaps inherited artifacts. Um, and creating then products or services that are suitable to be gifted or for gift giving can be beneficial and can create more successful products. So holiday souvenirs, you might think they're kind of naff or they're certainly probably not the best design. However, you probably tend to keep things for a while if you bought them on a holiday. Likewise with jewellery, if you bought that in a certain place or if someone's given it to you, 
as a gift, then you're unlikely to want to get rid of that quite so quickly unless circumstances change or something odd like that. Um, but yeah, jewellery. Um, and then maybe actually you inherit something that you really hate, but you've got a sense of guilt for wanting to get rid of that. So then maybe you make it your own, like that chair, which has been reupholstered, and you kind of then add to the narrative of it. So maybe this gets passed down through generations, and each generation puts their own stamp on it. But there's a clearly strong emotional reaction and emotional connection between those people and those products. Okay, so I'm sticking with meaning. Um, products that connect us to other people, like our smartphones and social networking platforms can also evoke strong emotions. Um, and products that facilitate activities with others, things like the teapot, also evoke strong emotional responses that mean a lot to us. Things like maybe uh, your kind of dinner set, it's a bit retro now, but I bet people still have certain items of dinnerware and things that are for best and they come out at Christmas or you know, kind of decorations and things, again, that you may well have an emotional connection to because of their meaning, because they've been passed down through generations, because they represent happy memories. Another strategy to create meaning is the use of customization and personalization. So some products have this, others don't, and you do have to look at the um, kind of feasibility of customization because it can obviously add a lot to production costs and things. But research shows that the ability to customize some products increases the consumer's willingness to purchase something. And if you think about it, the time consuming process of customizing a product that gives the consumer the feeling they're also to some extent a co-designer means they've already begun to build a relationship with it. So you can go onto the Nike website, you can pick a pair of trainers and you can customize them. You can change all the colors, you can add text to it, you can change some of the kind of patterns and textures, put leather print on it if you want. But if you spent half an hour doing that, you're going to certainly already have a stronger relationship with that product than you would an off-the-shelf Nike pair of trainers, I'm sure. So customization where possible can really help. Same with the uh, Apple Watch, you know, big big kind of draw of that is that you can change that face to thousands of different possibilities and you can change it daily if you want to maybe to match your outfit and you can perhaps change the band as well or maybe you just want the Mickey Mouse uh, the Mickey Mouse kind of watch face there this is something um, a little different so this is looking at when uh, cake mixes first came out on the market um, in America I think it was maybe in kind of 50s um, and they actually did some research and found that they'd made it too simple and that people weren't buying them because they didn't um, get a, a big enough sense of pride for having made something. I think they made it so you didn't have to add eggs or something like that. And they actually then modified it so that you had to do more, you had to add more ingredients, you had to be more involved in the process and then sales increased. So it showed that actually the, the process of customizing it, making something yourself builds that pride, builds that emotional, um, response and uh, connection with a product and then one last one of course not all products should be customized so we probably remember uh, a few years ago now when Apple first launched the iPod um, and had the white headphones and they were the thing to be seen in um, so you certainly wouldn't have wanted a pair of black wired headphones then you, if you were an Apple fan you wanted white wired headphones to fit in to follow that trend so sometimes customization isn't always good you have to look at the kind of products that you're buying it to. <clears throat> okay I've got one more thing for meaning which is patina so in order to accumulate memories a product could show signs of wear using materials that are unique or change over time also known as patina and the Japanese philosophy Wabi Sabi recognizes the quality of products by their story and journey rather than their functionality seen imperfections and patina as valuable. Um, so for instance, if you've maybe inherited some old tools from your grandfather um, and the wood has worn in such a way that was caused by his use, the, the way that um, he used them and those markings and wear on a product actually holds kind of memories and, and history within it. So if you are able to develop products that possibly have an opportunity to wear in a nice way, not in a damaged way, then um, 
that could work well. In fact, just yesterday, I think Converse launched these new trainers, they're 70 pounds, and they come like that, pre-dirtified. Uh, so they are filthy and designed to look like that. So if you want to pay 70 pounds for that, you can do. Um, okay, so I've kind of talked through my three main key themes, the aesthetic element, the functionality element, and the meaning element. And then I'm just going to recap before wrapping up some of the points. So anthropomorphism, this kind of aesthetic technique, which can help communicate um, functionality and add fun and a sense of uh, interest to products. There's customization, of course, where you can uh, tweak the aesthetics of a product and create more meaning in it. Visual metaphors can, again, communicate meaning, but also add a bit of fun, inject a sense of, uh, yeah, of funness. Nudge design to tweak people's behavior, and that isn't just with digital um, things, you can use physical uh, changes in people's behavior too. Uh, slow design to consider the pace at which people are using products and if that can enhance the consumer experience. Atina, do you want this product's aesthetics to wear? Maybe like a leather jacket or something that's going to age and change over time. Uh, effective design is kind of the opposite of slow, but this is a big, uh, the opposite of nudge, sorry. So this is kind of shouting to uh, call attention to products. And of course, from a meaning point of view, you've got to think about the people, places, and memories that are associated with um, that product. Brilliant, okay, so that's my kind of overview of the three sections. Um, if you've got any questions, think about those now. I'm just gonna run through a few other slides and then I'm gonna ask Anna to pass those questions through if you have any and answer them. Um, but if you'd like more information kind of about what I've been talking about, um, or if you want to know more about emotional design or perhaps see the references of some of the research I've discussed, which comes from a whole range of designers, um, please get in touch. And likewise, if you'd like to be involved in my future research as part of my PhD, again, get in touch. So I'm going to be carrying out um, some surveys and some workshops looking at actually emotional design of furniture in particular. And if you think that's something you'd like to get involved with uh, at the university, then please contact me. I'm on dan.lewis at staffs.ac.uk. Um, and also, if you're a business or you work at a business and you think you could benefit from placement students, they can bring fresh ideas, skills, and a positive kind of can-do attitude to your business, then you can contact uh, Joe on John Anderson and if you want to copy me in or contact me. So if you think that you might want a student, even if it's kind of for a few weeks or months, right up to a year, um, we have students always uh, looking for placements within design and engineering and marketing and all different sorts of areas, please just do get in touch. Um, we also have uh, our enterprise zone. So this is just to point out really some great things that we uh, have within our enterprise zone. We're going to have an incubation centre um, and launch pad to help people um, kind of launch new um, enterprises. Uh, we've got funded support for SMEs. Um, and uh, we actually have current strategy SMEs who are fully funded projects now running uh, with access to innovation labs, workshops, facilities, students, graduates, researchers. Um, if you need help with new product development, prototyping, process, innovation, all of these kind of things, digital advanced manufacturing materials, we're going to have then any of that sort of thing that you think you're interested in, you can get in touch to our uh, our team on employers at Stats. As I mentioned, we've got more webinars coming up, uh, hashtag Stats Innovation, and if you go to that uh, link there, stats.ac.uk forward slash events, you can um, have a look at our upcoming webinars. Um, so if you've got any questions, please send them through. I can see, uh, I think, first one here from Anna, which uh, looks like a hard question. Are there examples of Patina in the digital realm? That's a good point, actually. I mean, because clearly within digital, you get a lot of um, customization. And we talked about the Apple watch faces and um, kind of customizing profiles. And there's a lot of customization, or maybe not customization, but kind of feeds that um, are feeding you your interests. Um, but that's quite a nice idea to consider if maybe an app or a website changes over time, evolves over time. 
Um, I think that, I guess that's what the question's about. If there's anything else specific around that, um, I don't know of any examples of Tina in terms of apps or websites. Um, no, sorry. But it's a, it is an interesting idea to think about how that could be applied. I think maybe kind of apps and things around um, around kind of mindfulness and counselling and things like that, apps that support you and kind of they change over time. There's some very basic ones, things like where you plant a tree and then how you use the app will affect that and that kind of changes over time. But that's almost kind of a game. I think actual looking at patina on digital is a really interesting idea. Um, another question from Rachel, have you seen any examples of emotional design during the COVID crisis? Um, another tricky question. Sure I did, I'm trying to remember what it was. Um, I think we're seeing a lot change in terms of in terms of spaces and places becoming of course less social, um, but also people doing things that are more social with kind of neighbours and and supporting each other and um, things like that. And I think there's opportunities there. Um, okay. And of course, there's a lot of products as well that are kind of about protective wear, PPE and stuff, and, and people considering things like masks that have clear plastic bits so that you're still able to create this personal connection between two people and it's not quite as anonymous. Um, and there's a lot of design of, yeah, new and different PPE um, around that. So that's definitely considering social media. Um, question from Annie, is digital cleaner is maybe more like things going viral on social media? Yeah, perhaps. Yeah, I suppose when something does go viral on social media, you could argue that that is growing in kind of a snowball effect, isn't it? And adding to it, I suppose you're in danger then of the kind of fake news thing that um, that people start publishing it or feeding it in a way that isn't quite honest or truthful about what the original intent was. Um, but certainly, yeah, I think that's quite a nice idea that as things grow and snowball on social media, that they're building the narrative. And the narrative is in some case changing, but as I said, that can also be bad. Um, but yeah, that's that's an interesting way to look at a kind of digital patina. I saw um, a product that was a cycle bag. Um, and as you you kind of linked it up, you didn't link the bag, but you had a, an associated app that followed your cycling around your neighbourhood and then it mapped on to a kind of abstract pattern the map, the journey that you'd taken and then that customised your bag. So the bag you had represented the kind of journeys you took. So all bags were unique and that was a kind of, it was a in some ways an artificial patina, it was more like customization, but that was a kind of digital thing. A uh, question from Jason, have you seen good examples of emotional design in the charity sector. Okay, I think definitely in terms of marketing uh, and kind of nudge, there's lots of really good nudge design um, within the marketing of the charity sector in terms of uh, when you see, um, I saw one and it was a way of getting people to donate uh, physical money, which I guess maybe isn't ideal at the moment, by voting for things in a physical kind of um, bin sense. Um, but there's lots of advertising campaigns that use emotional design. Yeah, you can just sort of Google that emotional design um, marketing campaigns um, that, yeah, pull on the kind of heartstrings really. Um, question from Mark, how could emotional design improve the design currently used in autonomous robots? Okay, so yeah, that's another interesting one. I think a lot of the autonomous robots um, now, either go, they go for one of two approaches, either anthropomorphize it and make it so it's got a clear character, it's got human characteristics, it's got a face, or it's just totally robotic, bland, and has no, um, it looks very industrial. Um, and I think it depends on the, um, the situation where it's going to be used. If you're in a 
Amazon factory and uh, Amazon warehouse rather in um, maybe interacting with very, very few people and perhaps it doesn't need to have any kind of character to it. But clearly if it's in a public sector place and it's interacting a lot with people, especially if it's kind of children or maybe it's in a healthcare setting or something, then it probably does need to have a character. But you also get this kind of uncanny valley thing where you make it too human, but it's not quite human and it's actually just a bit, and it's a bit creepy. And I think you need to consider um, where yeah, what's relevant to that particular place. Um, but yeah, that's a, a nice idea. Um, what other things in terms of motion design? Um, robots, I think. I don't know. I'm just going to check. I've got through your questions. Um, does anyone else have any last questions before we uh, kind of sign up? Okay, I think that is everyone's questions then. Um, if you if you were any people who asked those questions and you want any want to ask those and have see if I can get a little bit more or do because it's quite hard to think on the spot but I'm sure I've seen some examples of some of the things then please feel free to email me um, as I as I said earlier it's uh, dan.lewis at staffs.ac.uk and keep in touch uh, if you want to know anything else about uh, emotional design um, please yeah get in touch um, just a reminder then that we've still got more webinars coming up you can go to staffs.ac.uk forward slash events staffs innovate on twitter I'm Dan Lewis design on twitter um, I believe we're all going to send out a, a quick survey for you to complete. If you could do that, I'd be really appreciated so I get an idea of uh, what you thought of this presentation. Um, I'm hoping you found it interesting and useful. Thank you all for coming. Uh, it's good to see so many of you here. Um, thanks again. Enjoy the rest of your day and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks, bye.